Good evening, my name is Jim Walker. I'm the pastor of Revival from Down Under in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, tonight I'm going to speak on the remnant of the woman's seed spoken of in Revelation 12 verse 17. So let's first read what it says. Revelation 12. Verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The word remnant comes from the Greek word loipoi, meaning the ones who remain or the remaining ones the rest are residue. The rest are residue. Uh, when we study scripture, there are, I find, because of misinterpretation of scripture and not rightly dividing scripture, uh, we don't have understanding of who this remnant is. And to understand who the remnant is, you must first understand who the woman is that she's the remnant of. So unless you understand who the woman is, you won't get an understanding of who the remnant are. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 15, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to study rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This studying, I believe, must be done from all scripture. And as we study from all scripture, it helps us to rightly divide the word. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that has proceeded from the mouth of God. And the Bible is every word that has proceeded from the mouth of God. From Genesis to Revelation is the words that God has spoken, written down by those he chose to write them down. For our learning, for our benefit. Also in Romans 15 and in verse 4, the Apostle Paul tells us, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Uh, the things written aforetime being Old Testament Scripture. And when we study Old Testament Scripture, we find that God has hidden within the Old Testament Scriptures type shadows uh, uh, symbols, uh, figures, etc., concerning what he's going to do through his church, but also it hides him. He is, he is uh, hidden in, in shadow and type in the Old Testament. Apostle Paul also tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3, and in verse 16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Oh, it's profitable if you hear it and do what the scriptures are saying. It can only be profitable for you if you are willing to be corrected. You, you, you may have an incorrect understanding of Scripture and, and if you are not willing and open, then you're not going to go any further than where you are. Hallelujah. Praise your Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44 through 46, the Apostle Paul reveals to us the principle of God which is first the natural, and then afterwards that which is spiritual. In these verses, he uses Adam as an example, 
the first Adam, as the, an example of that which is natural, being made of the dust of the earth, and the second Adam being the spiritual, he that comes from heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. Two Adams. Two Adams. Did you know there were two Adams? Well, now you do. Hallelujah. The use of natural things to represent spiritual things is called symbolism. And we see Jesus used, used symbolism throughout the Gospels when he, when he taught in parables. A parable is the use of natural things to represent something else or that which is spiritual. And we know in the parable of the sower and the seed, for example, uh, when you study that, the seed speaks of the Word of God, symbolizes the Word of God. The ground into which the seed goes symbolizes the heart of man and the conditions that are in the ground that prevent the seed from producing fruit speak of conditions within the heart that is the works of the flesh that prevents the fruit from being produced and we need to produce fruit in John uh, in first John 5 I think it's verse 7 uh, the Apostle tells us that the Father God is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth to be, pr to be produced. James, sorry, James 5.7. James 5.7. Thank you. Uh, let's have a look at Revelation 12.1 and just read that. says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. So we've just read that which is heavenly is spiritual. So this is talking about something that's spiritual, even though it's, it, it's talking about the heavens, it's actually talking something about something that's going to happen on earth. It, it, it seems as though it's a bit of a contradiction, but it's not. It's something that's heavenly happening on earth. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Uh, to understand, uh, we, we, th again, that to understand this woman, we need to understand what the clothing is and who she is, and we'll find that out by studying. I believe the woman of Revelation 12 verse 1 is the true church. A woman symbolizes a church either true or false. In Revelation 17 1 you have the false woman, the false church. Revelation 12 the true church and we need to know the difference between the two. Both symbolized as, as a woman, but one good and one bad. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, the Apostle John tells us there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So that is... God the Father, God the Word, which in John's Gospel he tells us the Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word is pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. All right? Jesus is, is God incarnate in man. The Word of God incarnate in man is Jesus Christ. So, prior to Jesus Christ, it was the Word of God. Christ did not exist. He only exists, really, in, 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 in the prophetic. Even though he was a, a lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, he, he could not exist until he was born. 
and he was born and his name became Jesus Christ or Jesus. Hallelujah. So there are three that bear record and if we go into Psalm 19, Psalm 19, and in verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And they talk to us. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the heavens talk to us day after day. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day unto day they utter speech, and night unto night they show, they show knowledge. If I think it's in Romans, I'm not sure, just Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, verse 19, he said, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So created things represent the Godhead. Created things also represent other things, symbolically. And so these... The heavens declare the glory of God. When we look up into the sky, we see into the sky, we see three created things. We see the sun, the moon, and the stars. And these represent the glory of the Godhead. Alright? These represent the things that are made, represent the glory of the Godhead. And the woman of Revelation 12, 1 is clothed in the sun. The sun representing the, the, the glory of the Father. The moon representing the glory of Jesus Christ, the Son, which we'll read in a minute in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 through 3, that Jesus is the express image of his Father. And the moon doesn't have its own light, but is lit... Is, he, its light comes from the Son, and the light of Jesus comes from his Father. Amen? And so, and then the stars, although the stars being 12, speak of 12 apostles yet to come, but they also speak of the multiplicity of the Holy Spirit, who is numberless. He is numberless. He is the great number. He's numberless. All right? Thank you, Lord. God said, uh, God said to Abraham, look at, look at the stars and if you can number them. And that represents the Holy Spirit and also the seed of Abraham. In Matthew 24, Matthew 24 and in verse 29, Jesus clearly tells us immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall, the moon shall not give her light and the stars that sh shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's pretty clear. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, again, through misinterpretation of Scripture, um, some some preacher rapture, some preacher rapture that will occur uh, seven years before the end, and that all Christians will be caught up into heaven and not go through this tribulation period. Well, when we study the scriptures correctly, we'll find that this remnant of our Christians have to go through the last three and a half years. And in the last three and a half years, they're actually beheaded by the beast of Revelation 13. 
But all you've got to do is study to find these things out. It's pretty, all you, if you study, it, it's very simple, it's very clear. So how people can actually misinterpret scripture, I don't know. Because it's very, very clear. Jesus here in verse 29 is prophesying of the end times answering the question that was asked him in verse in verse um, verse 3 tell us when shall these things be what should be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world what should be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world also in verse 30 it says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man come in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. Glory to God. Now, I've actually missed a verse, so what I want to do is go back into I want to go to Psalm 84. Talking about the glory, the sun, sun glory. In Psalm, uh, Psalm 84 and in verse 11, it says... For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. And the Lord will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Got that? So if we walk uprightly, God's going to give us all good things. You know, that's what was required of Abraham back in Genesis, uh, I think Genesis 4. 17, I think maybe, he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. And that word perfect is upright. Walk before me and be thou upright and sincere. The sign of the Son of Man is the moon turning to blood. That is the sign of the Son of Man. If, if the moon symbolizes Jesus, the Son of God, then when it turns to blood, it's a sign of his crucifixion. The shedding of the blood by the Son of Man. And the moon is going to turn to blood. Now, my, my pastor, as I grew up in the, in the Lord, l believed that, the, that the, the moon is literally going to drip blood. It's actually going to not just turn red, it's going to drip blood. That's what he always believed. And we know that when we read the book of Revelation, one of the last plagues is he gives them blood to, to drink, just as he did in, 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 the, in Egypt. If we go into uh, Joel chapter 2, here in Joel chapter 2, Joel prophesies of what is going to occur at the end. Verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And there, there it is, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Hallelujah. Praise your Lord. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 
Verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being Jesus, who being the brightness of, of, of his glory, the brightness of the Father's glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus sat down at the right hand of his Father, and Jesus is the express image of his Father. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In 1 Corinthians 15, We just read in 1 Corinthians 15 about first the natural, then the spiritual. And if you go back a couple of verses, it actually says in verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory, so also in the resurrection. So in the resurrection, there are going to be different glories upon the people of God. And those glories, the, the, the glories will occur on them by... <coughs> by what word, through what word they have received to deal with their flesh. The more flesh you have dealt with, the more you're going to shine in glory. If you only have this much of your flesh dealt with, then you will be a star glory. If you have that much of your flesh dealt with, you will be a moon glory. But if you have this much dealt with, you'll finish up as a sun glory. And the bride of Christ is sun glory. The moon and the stars, are, she's clothed in the sun. The sun is her clothing. Hallelujah. Glo her, she, she's in the glory of God the Father. Also in that Second Corinthians chapter three, and verse eighteen says, "But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So you can't, you you don't become instantly." the glory of the sun. You've got to go from glory to glory to glory. And so you go from the glory of the stars, <coughs> speaking of your salvation, the glory of the moon, where we get infilled with the Holy Spirit, and then the glory of the sun, speaking of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the, the full production the full producing of fruit, full fruit in our lives. Hallelujah. The Amplified Bible says of this verse, Second Corinthians, and all of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into his very own image, in ever-increasing splendor, and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit of God. Who is the Spirit? So here, just a, 
an awesome thing that God is going to do within people that are willing to be transformed. Willing. See, you can be, you know, you can be, uh, uh, when we first started off, we had a baby. Uh, you, you, could, you could liken that to, uh, you know, we have a, you, you, you have a caterpillar. A caterpillar, some caterpillars are beautiful, some are not so beautiful. But a caterpillar goes through a transformation to become a magnificent butterfly. It starts off by, <laughs> it starts off as an egg. And then it, as a seed, really, that's what it is. The egg is the seed and, the, and it hatches. And we start off being born again from a seed. And, 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 and as babies, all babies want to do, you know, the last few days we've had a baby magpie. It's an Australian bird, an Australian magpie. And it's dad, uh, well, three of them actually, and they, they come outside our window and, um, and the father feeds them. And all they do is eat, 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 eat. And that's what we are required to do as babies. All we are to do is, required to do is, eat the word, eat the word, eat. And as we continue to eat the word, change happens. And we start to grow up. And we start to go, and that's what a, that's what a caterpillar does. A caterpillar, all it does through its, through its, it's staged is eat. That's all they do. They don't do twenty-four, almost twenty-four seven. They just eat, and they, until they come to a stage where they are fully grown, and then they pupate. They go into a la, into a pupa, and then another transformation takes place. But this transformation takes place while it's at rest. It's not doing anything. It's at rest. And we, our greatest change occurs in our life when we stop doing the works of the flesh and we come to a place of rest and the change takes place. Then out comes the butterfly. Amen? That's what God's doing in each one of us. He's taking us from the hungry caterpillar through to the magnificent, beautiful butterfly. Glory to God. And only he can do it. Only he can do it. In Revelation 21, it talks about the city of God through Revelation 21. And it says in verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the city of God, New Jerusalem, is likened as the bride of Christ. It is bride. Then if we read, if we read verses, uh, if we read now verse 9 and 11, 9 and 11 it says uh, there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying come here and I will show you the bride the lamb's wife so this is now very clear I'll show you the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spiritual great and high mountain and showed me the great city the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Again, this is something that is spiritual. It's something that is going to occur spiritually. Verse 11, And the holy city, the bride of Christ, has the glory of God. Having the glory of God and her light, 
was like unto a stone most precious. So here, the city of God has got the glory of God. The bride of Christ got the glory of God. And the woman of Revelation 12 verse 1 has got the glory of God the Father on her. She's got the glory of God. Now, this is actually pro Revelation 21. It's prophesied in Isaiah, six, in Isaiah 60, which we'll just have a look at in, in a second. But I just want to, in, um, in Revelation 19, and in verse 7 it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. His wife has made herself ready. We're going to come back to that in a minute. All right? So she, has, she makes herself ready by washing in the water of the word. Because she is without, she's got to be without spot, wrinkle or blemish. According to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27 which we'll also look, look at in a minute. But first, let's go to Isaiah 61. She makes herself ready by washing. Isaiah 61. And verse 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. This garment of salvation is given to you when? When you're born again. Until you're born again, you're naked. So when you get born again, he gives you a garment of salvation as a covering. But then he says, and he has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornament, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. The woman of Revelation 12 has a diadem of 12 stars. She's decked with jewels. Back in Revelation 21. I've read verse 9 and 11, so we'll do uh, Revelation 21. Revelation 19. His wife has made herself ready, and to her was granted that she, verse 8, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For client fact, Fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now just keep your hand in that. And, and this fine linen is bought. Now I had a, a lady once in, in the church said to me, why are you always paying, uh, preaching we, we have to pay a price? when Jesus paid the price. And this is a lady that's been in God for a while. And, you know, I didn't get the chance really to answer her. And the answer is, because the Bible says so. The Bible says we have to pay a price. And so, if we go into um, Revelation chapter 2, Revelation 3, Revelation chapter 3. And in verse 18 it says, Jesus speaking, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Buy. Buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. And white raiment, your white raiment is purchased that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. 
So white raiment is the righteousness of the saints. And it is purchased. We pay for it. How do you pay for it? With your life. By dying to self. By offering yourself as a living sacrifice to God. If you're not willing to do that, then you won't be in the bride of Christ. And many Christians are not going to make the bride of Christ. They will either be come out as the, a remnant or they will come out as being wedding guests. They didn't completely die. They will be star glory, speaks of the remnant. <coughs> Moon glory speaks of those that will be wedding guests. And sun glory speaks of those that will make it to be the bride of Christ. <coughs> In Isaiah chapter 60, And in verse 1, it says, again, this is the whole Isaiah 60 is prophesying of Revelation 21. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Isn't that a fantastic promise? It will be seen upon those that are willing to die to self. Completely die to the works of the flesh. In verse 19 it says, the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Thy God thy glory. As I said again, this is all prophetic of Revelation 21 and the city of God. When we study scripture correctly, rightly divining it, we will find there is uh, the bride of Christ, there are those that are wedding guests to the wedding feast, and there will be those that will miss out completely. They actually have, they, 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 they have the door to the wedding shut on them. And the reason they have it shut on them is because they run out of oil and the lamps go out. And we'll see that in a minute in Matthew 25 and also the wedding spoken of in Matthew 22. Let's read Matthew 22 first. Matthew 22. When we I don't want to read all this. You can read it in your own time. But it says in verse 2 and 3, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And that certain king is God the Father. And God the Father is going to make a marriage for his son, his son being Jesus Christ. And that marriage, when we study marriages, it's actually foreshadowed throughout the Old Testament. The marriage of the Lamb is foreshadowed all the way through the Old Testament. But we, uh, you know, for, to study it properly, we, we haven't got enough time tonight or, you know. It, it's a massive study to do it correctly. Verse 3, And he sent forth his servants 
to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. So there are, there are those that will be bidden to the wedding but for whatever reason they will make excuses not to come to the wedding feast. Now all Christians are bidden to the wedding but not all Christians will actually be a part of it. And so we find as we read on he says, go into the highways and byways and bid them to come in so that the wedding feast may be furnished with guests. And so if we go into verse, um, verse 10, so those servants went out into the highways and, and gathered together as many as they could both and good and bad and the wedding was furnished with guests. By the wayside, these are Christians that are not doing it God's way. They've fallen away. They've fallen away and they're, they're in a state of back, being backslidden. And there's a call going to go out. The bridegroom's coming. Go out and meet him. And, the, and when you look at Matthew 25, the wise and foolish virgins... They fall asleep. They go out, but then they're at the side of the road and they fall asleep at the side of the road waiting for the bridal party to come past. Then a shout goes out, Behold, the bridegroom comes. And they wake up, but the foolish find out the lamps have gone out. A turnover, Matthew 25, verse 6. And at midnight, the cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. Well, they're already out. They're at the side of the road asleep. And there's a call going to go out in these last days. Behold, the bridegroom comes. And that call will cause people to wake up because they'll realise they've missed it. They've missed the wedding. And if they don't wake up, they're also going to miss the wedding feast. So in these last days, we, ne we need to be awake. And the Apostle Paul said, Awake thou who sleeps, and I will give you rest. So, here, in the wise and foolish virgins are two-thirds. Two-thirds of the church, and they are asleep at the time of the wedding feast. The bride, she will not be asleep. Because she'll be watching for her husband to come. She'll be too busy getting herself ready to fall asleep. If you're busy, you, you, can't, you don't fall asleep if you're busy. You keep yourself busy, you don't fall asleep. Then all those virg virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Givers of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us in you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. So here, we, in Revelation, we have the garments being bought. Here we have the oil being bought. Those that have paid the price, have bought enough oil, it keeps the lamps working, and this is your lamp. This is the lamp that helps you to find the door. This is the lamp that helps you to be a part of the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were met ready went in with him to the place of the wedding feast. 
and the door was closed. Then the other virgins came, said, Lord, open unto us. And he said, I don't even know you. How would you like him to say that to you? I don't know you. He doesn't know us if we don't know him. That's as simple as that. If you don't know him, how can he ever know you? Because it works two ways. And the way we know him is from front to back. All scripture. That's how you get to know him. His bride is going to be just like him. His bride is going to be in his image and likeness. And if, if, you, if the bride is going to be in his image and likeness, it's because they're like him, because they know what he's like. They've read about him, they've studied him from Genesis through to Revelation, and they're just like him. They're full of the word. Glory to God. So the call's going out, and I believe the cry is actually going out right now. And, and the cry will get louder the nearer to the wedding feast. The nearer the wedding feast comes, the louder the call will be. And we're actually going to be you know, we can, we can make up excuses. I, I, was, I was too busy doing this. I was too busy doing that. Well, it's your choice. Especially if you can see that day coming. If you can see that day coming and you, you just make, don't make room for that day and you're too busy, do, well, you probably don't deserve to be there anyway. If we go into uh, Revelation chapter 12 and in verse 6 it says the woman And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has pla a place prepared of God that they should feed her there for, for 1260 days. I believe this is the time of the wedding feast. I believe it's the time of the wedding feast where she's fed by God, nourished by God. And the wise virgins get in as wedding guests, but the foolish virgins are shut out. They're shut out and they have to go through the, the last three and a half years of tribulation when the beast rules all the earth. And that will not be a nice time. It will not be a nice time. Let's read Revelation 12 verse 17 again. And the dragon, who is the dragon? Satan is the dragon, it says so if you read earlier on in the scripture. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war. Went to make war with the remnant or the remainder of the woman's seed. Who have, they keep the commandments of God, so they're Christians, and they have a testimony. But they didn't have enough of, of a testimony. And the testimony that they had was not enough to lose the life completely. They wanted to retain some of their life. And we see that when we read verse 11. 11, it says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. They were complete sacrifices unto God. They'd offered themselves completely, totally surrendering to God, being totally a sacrifice unto God well-pleasing. 
This again, this uh, verse has been incorrectly derided. Because some preach that, you know, we plead the blood. No, well, you're saved by the blood. We're redeemed by the blood. We overcome Satan by being redeemed by the blood. And what are the part does what are the part does the blood what part does the blood have in a Christian's life? It's not pleading it. What part what part does it have in your life, Richard? Taking communion. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Because every time we go to communion, take of, the, of communion, we're partaking of the blood, and in his blood there is strength to overcome. Hallelujah. Strength for healing, strength for overcoming. Stre All your needs are in the blood of communion. And as we partake of the blood, we overcome the devil. And by the word of our testimony. And we know Jesus overcome, Matthew 4, 4, by the word of his testimony. It is written. That is the testimony, and that is how we overcome. By knowing scripture and quoting it back to Satan. Satan, is it not written? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Again, in, in Revelation 12, 17, it says, The dragon made war with them. So if we now go, this, three, this 1260 days, this 1260 days is this, that, they, that the woman, the woman is taken into a wilderness for 1260 days. So the remnant had the same period of time, but not in the wilderness. 1260 days. Were the dragon will make war with her. And 1260 days is three and a half years, or 42 months. So when we study Revelation 13 and the rule of the two beasts, Verse 5, it says, There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and he continues for 42 months. So he's given 42 months. And when we read Revelation 19, Revelation, keep your hand in Revelation 13, Revelation 19, and it says, verse 20, And the beast was taken and within the false prophet that wrought miracles before them, and they were cast into the lake of fire. This is at the return of Christ. At the return of Christ, the, at the end of 42 months of their reign, they are taken by Christ at his return and cast into the lake of fire. So they have 42 months, Jesus comes back, and during that 42 months, he makes war with the remnant of the woman's seed, kills them and overcomes them. And it says there in verse 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And these saints he overcomes are the remnant of the woman's seed. The foolish virgin class, the foolish virgins of Matthew 25. Also we see that confirmed that they are killed by the beast. If you go into uh, verse, verse uh, 14, and he deceived them, dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles, which is power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and lives. Verse 15, And his power to give life unto the image of the beast, 
that the image of the beast should speak and cause that as many that would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And the, the, what, the, the remnant will realize they've missed it, they will not receive the mark of the beast, and he will kill them. How did he kill them? Revelation 20 verse 4 tells us how he kills them. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, or his image, or took his name in the head or in the forehand. So this is during the last 42 months. These Christians are killed. They are the foolish virgin class. They are the remnant of the woman's seed that don't make the wedding feast and are not, they do not go in as wedding guests. Go back into Revelation 19. Verse 9, and he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. The wise and foolish virgins, the call goes out. The bridegroom is coming. And the foolish run out of oil and can't find the door. And Jesus is the door. And this is what we need to find the door. And his name is? Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. And everybody said, I think that's enough. Glory to God.